So I think um, I think I will go ahead and start. Um, Ed Watts uh, needs no introduction, um, but I will say that Ed is one of the most distinguished figures really in North America in the study of the classical, the late antique, and the Byzantine world. Um, Ed holds the endowed chair in Byzantine uh, Greek history here at, at, at UCSD, the Vasiliadis chair. And uh, Ed has been uh, distinguished not only for his teaching and his administrative work, but for his remarkable productivity. Uh, many books seem to flow uh, immediately from Ed's pen, or maybe I should say from Ed's laptop. And uh, we'll be discussing uh, his most recent book here. I also want to just acknowledge Ed's leadership uh, as uh, the current chair of the history department and as a signal member in the division of arts and humanities. Ed has really been uh, leading a very important group of humanist uh, scholars and teachers in the kind of work that I think all of us agree is central to the American public university. And so with that kind of introduction, I want to just uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, bringing Ed into the conversation with his new book about the Roman Empire in a state of continuous decline. And what Ed and I thought we would do is do this as a conversation for the first 35 minutes or so. Um, I would ask a few pointed questions based on passages from Ed's book. Ed would respond, and then I hope we have time for about 20 minutes of Q&A, which I will moderate. I think probably by about one o'clock, most of us may have someplace else to be, but I'm looking forward to the next hour uh, of very fruitful conversation. So Ed, um, welcome, and I read your book several times, and in looking over it over the weekend, I came across this. I, what I love about your book, Ed, is that you have sentences like the following. I wrote this book to explain, thank you, Ed, being direct. What is the book explaining? This seemingly innocuous narrative of Roman decline that as you say, seems so destructive. And you say in the book, everyone who has a passing familiarity with Roman history or literature is aware of the pervasiveness of the story, but no one has brought together the stories of the people who spun these tales of Roman decline and peddled Roman renewal. This book does. Ed, I'm going to turn it over to you. And for those of us who have or have not read your book, tell us, what does this book do? Thanks, Seth. So I, I want to start by, um, by thanking Seth for a conversation we had years ago when I first got to campus, where we talked about these questions of what can you do by telling a story from antiquity in a way that resonates and relates to things that are happening now? Um, and over the last, really last five years or so, this is what I've been trying to do is to kind of fulfill the promise that I made in that conversation to take these stories from antiquity and try to figure out ways that the stories from antiquity can be told truthfully, but also with a way that um, focuses on their implications for the present. And so what this book grew out of actually was a, a set of conversations about um, with my editor uh, about another book that I was writing where I was really uncomfortable with how we had decided to kind of break up two parts of the book. Um, one part would end with the end of uh, the Roman empire as a unified state in the fourth century. And it would begin, the next phase would begin as you looked at the state failing to absorb other people. Uh, and what I realized was this is actually a story that has become used for political purposes in this world. You know, now this is used by the alt-right as a way to um, attack states that are trying to integrate immigrants. It's been used as a kind of xenophobic trope. Um, and it's been used in a way that isn't true to what the Romans are actually doing. In a sense, what, what has happened is people have taken a Roman rhetoric and assumed its reality and then applied it to our world to try to teach us lessons about how we should be behaving and what policies we should be pursuing. So this book was my attempt to say that that narrative of Roman decline is something that we always have to be cautious about. And it's also something that translates to a modern context where we can talk about decline and we can proclaim renewal um, and we think it's innocuous. And Romans to a degree thought it was innocuous too. They thought it was a sort of unbiased observation of change in their society. In reality, when Romans are talking about decline and promising renewal, this is a weapon. 
Um, and it's a weapon usually used to do one of two things. I mean, there are uh, circumstances in which the state is actually declining, but the people responsible for superintending that state use this rhetoric of decline to attack other people instead of addressing the actual problems the state faces. Um, even more insidious is when Romans use the story of decline to invent a problem that doesn't really exist and target other people for causing it. Um, and in the Roman Empire and in the Roman Republic, we see this happen a number of times where actually things are going reasonably well by most objective measures, but there are people who a particular politician disagrees with or doesn't like, uh, and they create this story that this person is causing problems in the Roman state or is doing things that will eventually cause problems, which is of course a prophecy that can never be uh, definitively disproven and those people are victimized. Uh, but the other thing that became clear to me in this book is there are moments in Roman history where they do it right, you know, where there is actually a problem. The state is actually suffering from something serious um, and leaders actually understand that decline when addressed effectively is a catalyzing force to bring society together. And there are moments in Roman history where leaders, emperors or leaders of the Roman Republic uh, come together and say, in essence, there's a real problem in our society. We're not gonna blame anybody for causing it. We're just gonna try to fix it. And the best way to fix it is for everybody to acknowledge the problem exists and then figure out what they individually can do to try to fix this problem. And collectively our jobs as leaders of a society will be to organize those people, bring them together and be sure that everybody is contributing to the solution that we need to have to fix these problems in the way that they are most capable. And so the story of Roman decline is something that is always there from the beginning of Roman literature, you know, from the plays of Plautus, the very first sort of big corpus of Latin literature that we possess, Plautus is making fun of this idea as something that's old, you know, something that is ridiculous and dated. Um, and this continues to the point where, you know, we're seeing like Ronald Reagan give a speech in 1970 that is using the idea of Roman decline to attack the anti-war movement and to attack women's liberation. Phyllis Schlafly uses it multiple times to attack everything from the ERA to um, immigration. Uh, this is a thing that has been with us for at least 2,200 years. Um, and so it's a thing that has a lot of meaning and the idea can be dangerous, but it's also an idea that if we approach it correctly and we understand that this can be a galvanizing force for positive change, um, it's also an idea we can take good lessons from as opposed to just cautionary tales. So Seth, that's what I was trying to do in the book and hopefully that's well, what, what comes through. It absolutely does, Ed. And uh, that leads to really two questions. One is the way that you're able to write this history in such a flowing narrative way, it really is a story, it is history of storytelling, but it's also history that's deeply archival. And I guess the question that I would wanna ask then is, for those of us who are not professional historians coming to your book, your book is gonna teach us a lot about the Roman empire and a lot about the rhetoric of decline. Your book is also gonna teach us a lot about the business of being a historian, the craft of history, the way of doing the kind of history that you wanna do. And I was wondering if you could address that as well. Yeah, and that's a great question um, because I think if you, if you pay close attention to the footnotes, you can probably see when COVID happened. Um, because there is a lot of access to raw materials up to a certain point. And after that point, I can't access the materials in the way that I would like to. And so I'm having to access them through secondary sources. Um, and so some of the things with like Charles V, who is a Spanish slash Holy Roman Emperor, the person in charge of Spain when they conquer Peru and Mexico, also the uh, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire that's fighting Suleiman the Magnificent, an incredible character who unfortunately I could not access the materials directly because I was locked down in my house. So if you read the book closely, you can probably see the moment I got locked down. But until that point, what I tried to do was um, work as much as I could through literary sources that have the most direct conversations about Roman decline and its consequences, but then also build out from those literary sources to use anything else that I had. So. Um, those are some of you who know me know that I, I love Roman coins. I geek out on this all the time. Um, my students, I don't see many here, but my students know that this is like what I love to spend time talking about. There's tons of places where Roman coins are really useful for this. 
There's also tons of places where architecture is really useful. Um, I mean, one of the most fascinating uh, architectural monuments is the, the um, octagonal church that Charlemagne built in Aachen. Uh, and this is a church that is in many ways a, a physical embodiment of the idea of Roman renewal that Charlemagne is backing when the Holy Roman Empire is created with the proclamation of Charlemagne as Roman Emperor on Christmas of eight, year 800. Because that church contains materials that were basically plundered from Roman capitals like Ravenna. Um, and so there's marble in those and columns and flooring and other things that Charlemagne very intentionally took from the actual Roman Empire and rebuilt it and reconfigured it and reconstructed it in what we call Aachen, but what he called Roma Ventura, future Rome. Um, and so you see the idea of Roman decline and renewal in texts for sure, but you also see it in buildings. You also see it in structures. And the really cool thing is sometimes you have sources that say, I went to this structure because I wanted to commune with the Roman past. And you have that said by Cato or by uh, Seneca in the first century AD. You have that said by people writing hymns in the sixth century AD. You have that said by poets working in the Anglo-Saxon period in England. You have that said by fascist propagandists in the 1930s. And so there is this very real sense that these sources that the historian can consult can also be enlivened by the experience of interacting with them. Um, and that was one of the really interesting aspects of the project is kind of that circle going from text to material object back to text to understand the entire experience of Roman decline, you know, as a tangible reality that these people went through. I, I just love that, Ed. That's just so wonderful because I love the idea of, of communing with the object, with the, with, the, with the built environment, but also the idea that in many ways, buildings are like text. You know, coming from a literature background, you know, for me, everything is readable. And so the buildings always have an inscribed or symbolic or kind of readable value to them in that kind of way. And I love this image of Charlemagne sort of plundering uh, 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 Ravenna and, and, and old imperial stuff and, and building his, his, his world out of these stones and bricks and, uh, and porphyry columns of of all of this kind of stuff. Let me just ask you to follow up on that. I mean, do you see this? You, you talk about this as your particular approach. Can you open this up and tell us, I mean, is this where you think history should be going or could be going? Is this a, is this a new model for history? Uh, so I think that there there is something, you know, there's always a turn in history. And one of the recent turns is the material turn where people are looking at these objects and trying to understand the kind of stories of these objects. Um, but I think what's particularly important is, as historians, the most important task we have is to recover the stories of people who lived in the past to the degree that it's possible to do this. And that means not just their ideas, but their experiences and how they interpret and understand those experiences to be meaningful. Uh, and so I think one of the most important twists or, or maybe paths that we as historians can take is a kind of cultural turn um, that looks particularly at the, the way of living in these environments and the way that you learn to appreciate each of the stimuli that you're getting in a particular environment. Um, I think one of the most fascinating uh, things that, that I played with in working on this project was the, the Church of Hagia Sophia in, in Constantinople or, or in Istanbul. Um, it's very, very clear that that church was designed to work on a sensory level um, but the sensory level was something that was interpreted for the people experiencing worship in Hagia Sophia through the worship itself. And so the smells were controlled, the sounds were controlled, the sights were controlled, the way the lighting worked was controlled. Um, every aspect of the sensory experience of being there was manipulated, but also you were told when you sat in liturgy what you were supposed to be taking away from the smell of incense or the sight of um, light coming through the dome in a particular fashion or the sound of you know, people singing in that church. That's I think where we can go as historians. You know, The depth of the experience of people is something that is hard for us as historians to always capture. Um, it's hard for us to understand why a sound mattered in the way that it did to a person living 1500 years ago. Um, or why someone's personality mattered as much as their words or their actions. Um, but we can get there. 
You know, it, it's hard, it's hard work, but we can get there and there's, there are paths to do it. And sometimes our sources will line up in a spectacular way to allow us to get to that experience of somebody sitting in a building in the year 600 and thinking about Roman history. Um, and it is doable. Right, I think that's wonderful. And Ed, I just, you know, it presumes that people are people and that may seem either incredibly profound or arrestingly trivial. But I think a great deal of um, a certain kind of history always assumed that, that people were different at different times. And I think what you're getting at, if I'm not mistaking it, is that there is a continuity. There is a sense that we can recover and to some extent recapture, not just experience, but feeling, but thought, but personality. Because I, I want you to talk about personalities. I know it's, it's certainly true in this book, but so much of what you teach and so much of what you work on is biography. And you're really interested in the kind of archeology span of personality. I'm wondering if you could talk about that as motivating your sense of history here. Um, you know, I, I actually, I had a great conversation with a student a week or so ago uh, where she was talking about what is the advantage and disadvantage of writing history as narrative. And I said, well, the disadvantage is sometimes it's seen as simplistic history. The advantage is it's actually incredibly comprehensive argumentative history if it's done right. Because to make a narrative work, you have to go through a lot of, um, a lot of kind of, I suppose, almost textual archeology span and material archeology span to get at exactly who somebody is and why they might be acting in the way that they do. Um, there's a lot of social historical understanding that has to come into talking about what the personality of somebody is as they work in a particular environment. Um, so you know, to, to give one very quick example, um, this background is actually from a talk I gave three hours ago in Venice about, uh, well, in Venice, right? Um, about scholars in Alexandria and how a riot in Alexandria might well have been caused by the fact that they were jerks. Um, and the evidence actually says they're jerks. There's nothing that says these are nice people. Everything says these are terrible human beings who are terrible to each other. Um, I have written about this before. Never have I taken seriously the fact that these people were jerks. Um, but once you do that, you begin to realize there's a reason why those events played out in the way that they did. These people were intolerable. And if they were nice people and the exact same thing had happened in that classroom behind me, it would not have resulted in a riot. It would not have resulted in people getting arrested. It would have resulted in a stern talking to and everybody would have moved on. So personality matters. And there are moments where when you understand the context enough, you can see why it matters. Um, and some of those moments are really, really profound. Like I think if Cato the Elder had not existed, or Cato the Younger had not existed, Julius Caesar likely would not have needed to march on Rome. Um, I think that's a pretty blunt statement, but I think it's also probably a pretty true statement. Uh, and I think when you look at Cato, you see somebody whose personality can be recovered to a very large degree through the material that we have about him. Uh, and it's clear that Cato is somebody who claims to be guided by principle, but is really guided by a kind of pragmatic and almost jealous attitude towards his own political fortunes um, and pursuing those fortunes at the expense of really anything else. Um, so you can do this history of personality, but you also can't just plunk into an, in a situation you don't understand and begin talking about the history of someone's personality because the social context is really, really important. Um, so you can see what choices the individual had and why they make the particular choices, either good or bad choices that they do. Yes, I think that's wonderful. One of the things that strikes me about this book is not only the personalities, but as you say, these contexts, and you've mentioned your interest in coins. As I was rereading the book, it occurred to me, this is a book about wealth. It's a book about money. It's a book about not so much the, the, the economic consequences, but the way in which in the Roman world, you really have a very tangible, palpable sense of what it means to own, what it means to owe, what it means to have. And um, many scholars have viewed, as you know, in Roman history and in late antiquity, Peter Brown in particular, interested in the ideas of poverty, wealth, and, and so on. I'm wondering if you could talk about money as, as central to this book in so many ways. So I, I think that that's, uh, so there's a number of ways that I can do that. But one thing that I would say straight away, um, one of the things that we don't ever acknowledge, but we need to understand is that 
The idea of what citizen participation is in Rome is pretty similar to our idea of what citizen participation is. You know, when we vote, we don't expect that our vote is going to change the presidential election outcome, especially not in California, but we vote anyway, because it's a way of participating in a process and owning the results of that process, even though our voice individually matters very little in that process. That act of participation creates a kind of social contract. It creates a kind of stake that we have in the society in which we participate. And this is the Roman way of running a country, a republic, but also an empire. Because the way that the Romans understood citizenship is a citizen is not somebody like in classical Athens who is equal in the face of any kind of decision-making and in an assembly. Roman citizens are not equal. They understood they were not equal. Many of them didn't ever go to Rome to vote like ever in their life. But they understood that the act of being part of this citizen corporation was meaningful. Um, and it gave them an ownership in the good things that society did. One of the things that the emperors were really smart about doing, and you know, we can talk forever about Augustus, who's I think one of the most complicated figures in history because he's a terrible human being, but also in some ways, um, the architect of a remarkably resilient political system. What Augustus understood is there was a way to transfer that idea of being a participant in a society, but not determining the, out, the outcome of policies in that society and translate that from a Republican structure to an imperial structure. And so this idea of Roman citizens as participants in their state is something that never goes away. It doesn't even go away, you know, as you get into the high Byzantine empire. This is still a concept that is meaningful. The emperor doesn't own the state. This is not Louis XIV. The emperor, in a sense, serves the state and serves the people who belong to that state. And that's true across all of Roman history. So what it, why does wealth matter? Well, wealth is where the actual power game happens. Um, wealth is how people negotiate at the top to acquire positions of influence and maintain positions of influence that they already possess. Um, it is something that is in a way compatible with the structure because the participation in the state is still something that, you know, it still exists. You still as a citizen exist, even if somebody at the top of the empire is like in the case of the Emperor Didius Julianus, literally buying the throne. Um, he is still buying it from you. He still serves you. And if you do not want him to serve, and they did not want Didius Julianus to serve, um, if you do not want him to serve, he can be overthrown. It is not his right to be there. He serves. He doesn't control or own. Um, and so I think this creates a very interesting political dynamic because it allows this story of decline to be used as a weapon even against emperors. You know, you own, you are a participant, a citizen stakeholder in this entity that is the Roman state. And if somebody is doing a bad job running it, they have to be accountable to you. If you live in a monarchy that is a sort of divine right monarchy, you don't have that same freedom to say, basically, you're fired. Now, in the Roman Empire, if you're fired, usually you're dead. I mean, there are some emperors who retire. There's about five of them. Um, but mostly you're dead. Um, in the Byzantine Empire, it's more negotiable. You know, sometimes you got to go off to a monastery. Sometimes they cut your nose off and sent you to a monastery. But usually you fail as an emperor and you're dead. But the, per the purpose there um, is maintaining this idea of a citizen held corporation that uh, you administer on behalf of, but you do not own. Yeah, and I think that's so clear and it's so wonderful because it, it gives new meaning to all of these notions of exchange, of duty, of contract, of, 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 of this sort of life in Rome as a kind of contractual set of relationships. And one of the questions that I would logically want to go to would be to say, how does Christianity really change this? How is the, you know, the undeniable impact of Christianity is not just simply monotheism versus polytheism. It's a completely different relationship of contractual being, of, um, of notions of wealth and value, and of notions of, as you say, of service and Yeah, no, this is a really great, um, a really great thing because the story in Roman history up until really the fourth century is always one of looking backwards and checking the present in relation to the past. And so the story of Roman decline is so powerful because, you know, again, by the fourth century for at least 600 years, people have been looking back and saying, well, you know, 
things are better. Like we have better armies now. We're a bigger state, but our morality was better back in the day or our attitude towards equal distribution of wealth was better back in the day. Christians cannot say it was better back in the day because what they're doing is promising something different. And so the fourth century sees this really remarkable shift where this society that has always looked backwards, you know, has always looked to the past to check the present, all of a sudden is faced with this idea of progress. You know, this idea that society can become better than it ever has been before. And fourth century Christians start really pushing this idea that the Roman world can be created in a new fashion and be better than the pagan Roman world ever had been. Um, it's a couple things are interesting to note in that context. First, Constantine is the first Christian emperor, and a lot of the architecture of how this happens gets started by Constantine. But this idea of progress was not Constantine's idea. What Constantine said, in essence, was Christianity actually brings us back to something that's a, a primeval attachment to a uniform, singular God. And paganism has actually represented a decline from where we started. And so Christianity brings us back to something that was great before Rome even existed. And so Constantine is using a rhetoric of restoration, a rhetoric of decline and restoration to justify embracing Christianity. But his successors say, well, I mean, okay, but if we say that, we really can't do very much to force people to become Christian or to create an infrastructure that replaces paganism with Christianity. And so starting in the middle of the fourth century, Christians begin taking, using imperial power to take aggressive actions against pagans and they justify it with this idea of creating something new and better. It's not Constantine's idea, but this idea exists really up until you get into the fifth century and pagans who all along have been saying, this is going to actually make our society worse, uh, can look in the fifth century and say, hey, the city of Rome was sacked in 410. It hadn't been sacked for 800 years and it's sacked in 410 like 25 years after you dismantled the imperial um, support for traditional religion. So where is your progress? And right. it's interesting, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that no less a person than St. Augustine who never ever That's it. Yeah. walks away from a fight says, you know what, just walk away from that question because I don't have an answer for you. Yeah, that's the city of God, right? That's the whole question is like, you know, like how can you say, yes, bad things have happened now. And this is so good, there, there's one, last sort of large point I want to raise before we get into the Q&A. And that is the way in which your book touches on the non-Roman world or the way in which part of the narrative of Rome that many classicists and historians, uh, historians are realizing now is about the relationships between Rome and Rome and Greece, but also Rome and Africa, uh, Roman, uh, uh, Roman Arabia, uh, uh, Rome and the uh, uh, the challenges of the uh, uh, nascent uh, uh, Muslim uh, uh, rise and uh, and religious and social upheaval. Um, how much of the of the story of decline is also this externalized story of encountering the non-Roman? And as you say, it's so much a part of our own xenophobic narrative as well. Yeah. So this is a really great and complicated question, in part because. Um, Roman history, if you look at the state that is Roman and the people who are Roman living in it, starts somewhere in the eighth century BC, probably maybe before that, and it ends in 1453 AD. Uh, and so you start with Latin speaking Italian pagans and you end with Greek speaking Christians. Those are the last Romans, you know, the, the people in Constantinople in 1453 who are Greek speaking and Christian called their state um, Romania, they called their language Romaica, they called themselves Romoi. They are Romans. Um, and that is a story that's really hard to tell. Because um, when you read the earliest accounts of who Romans are, the stories that Livy and other people tell of the very earliest period of Roman history, it's a society that integrates outsiders. Um, the first Roman kings are Etruscan, they are Greek, they come from everywhere. And it's a society that says, if you have something to add to our society, come, join us, you know, make us better. Uh, and there are people who leave other parts of Italy because Rome offers them opportunities that don't exist anywhere, anywhere else. But as you get into the middle part of the Republic, Rome kind of shuts that down. It creates a structure where there's an insider and outsider dynamic. 
Um, and then as you get into the period after the Second Punic War, when the Republic starts controlling imperial territories, it creates a, a relationship with outsiders that is exploitative, where you take resources from those outsiders. And it takes a better part of 500 years for that to become undone. But once you get into the third century, all of those people that were the kind of colonized um, people who are dominated by Italy, uh, they become Roman citizens. And the state has to figure out how to become a state that incorporates all of them. But it does. I mean, this is the great success of the Roman state. It moves from something that's kind of like the British Empire to something that's like the United States, where everybody in it identifies as Roman. And that's how ultimately you get you know, Greeks in Constantinople as the last Romans. Because once the empire is this thing that stretches from Britain to Saudi Arabia and everybody in it is Roman, once it starts falling apart, what remains part of that state remains Roman and the other stuff isn't. So Britain stops being Roman, France stops being Roman, Spain stops being Roman. What keeps being Roman? Places like Ephesus, um, places like Constantinople. That's where the Romans stay. And so that's where the state ends. Um, but interestingly, this is why the empire, you know, the, the great success of those Greek speaking Romans is why you never really have a center of gravity established again in the West around something that is really a Roman empire, not a, let's put a title on a Frankish King Roman empire, but an actual reconstitution of the Roman empire. It, this, is, this is a fantastic narrative. I, you know, it's not a question of whether anyone here has read the book, but I think that if you have or if you haven't, I think the kinds of things Ed and I have been talking about for the last 40 minutes really do speak to so many of our interests. And if there is any Q&A, may I ask that you electronically raise your hand and I will call on you in the order in which your hand goes up. Uh, there'll be a little hand mark there. And uh, I see, oh, good. So we have... Uh, we have first Xantippe and then Mira. Can I ask you to go in that order, please? There this you go. This is a fascinating subject. Uh, um, I'm not a historian at all, so you know, please excuse me if for, for if I'm wrong in what I'm saying, uh, as uh, not educated enough. Um, my question. Um, you said that uh, the end of the Roman Empire is in uh, 1453 with the fall of Constantinople. If you consider that uh, uh, as a continuity of the Roman Empire, then my impression is that uh, the decline of the Byzantine Empire uh, started mainly when the, in 1204, the Franks uh, uh, conquered and attacked Constantinople. So is, are the, the Franks of Rome not part of the Roman Empire? So it is an internal uh, uh, <laughs> struggle, I mean, within the empire that led to the demise of the whole empire. Uh, that came to my mind, as you said, about uh, when it fell. Now, uh, but uh, as I was thinking about declines, in the beginning you said about the uh, modes in which uh, uh, decline manifested itself, like uh, uh, designating uh, enemies of the, of the empire and prosecuting them or this type of, of things. Uh, but from your experience uh, and uh, coming back to the question of uh, uh, Professor Lehrer, is there something unifying in history in uh, the turning point, transition point that you can identify that uh, uh, an empire declines, or there are internal strifes, or uh, something that you can feel that there is a transition to the decline. And that is uh, also common for other empires we have seen, uh, you know, um, the British Empire and so on. Um, right. And 
to finish, I don't know, it may be a little, uh, I, was, I was reading in the past very fascinated books by Peter Brown. I mean, I really, uh, really amazing books. So I think that he said that the, the ancient world finished with uh, uh, the Arabs uh, attacking Byzantium and so on. And that was the end of the, uh, uh, of the Hellenistic period. How is this part of the concept of the decline of, of the Roman Empire? Thank you, Zentipi. A lot of questions. Ed, would you like to uh, try and take a couple of that? Sure. I think in 1204, what you have is the, uh, it's the Fourth Crusade. And so these are, this is actually not a state actor. And they're called Franks in our Greek sources, but there are all kinds of people from all over the place. There is at that point still the Holy Roman Empire. They're not it. Um, and so when Charlemagne is trying to march against the Byzantines, um, he is claiming that this is basically an internal Roman civil strife, you know, and, and doesn't go anywhere. And, but that's the one time that those two empires really come to blows. And it doesn't result in much of anything except a few naval battles outside of Venice. And then everybody de-escalates. The Franks lose the power to um, attack East and the East becomes stronger and it dissuades them from doing it. So 1204 represents basically crusaders who are opportunistically attacking the city of Constantinople. Um, there's a case to be made that in 1204, the Roman state that starts in eight, the eighth century BC dies. Uh, what you have is a story of a coronation of an emperor in exile as the crusaders are entering the city and he then flees to um, Asia Minor and this starts the resistance that becomes the last great empire of Nicaea that ultimately retakes Constantinople. That story is about as good as Charlemagne's story of how he became Roman emperor. So we can, we wanted to say the state ends in 1204, but I don't think we can say that the crusaders are Roman in any real meaningful way. Um, and the Pope certainly doesn't think that they are. Uh, they're just, they claim to have established a kind of new government over this state in Constantinople, but it's not actually seen as such by really anybody. Um, the question about, so I guess the question about um, the end of the Hellenistic world, this really, I mean, periodization, and when you're drawing lines to establish the beginning and end of periods is really, really tricky because I don't think that anybody in say Constantinople in the year 1000, who was reading Polybius and reading Diodorus Siculus and, and reading about the history of the Roman state and also reading Thucydides and Herodotus would say that anything has ended, you know, that they are culturally cut off from that classical heritage. In fact, what they would say is, this has never died with us, this continues on, and that's why the texts are still there. Um, I think if you're a Roman historian and you think about it, it's interesting that the, the best, the closest thing we have to a continuous narrative of Roman history from beginning to end is not in Latin, it's in Greek. Because the Byzantines are the ones who read this stuff because it was their history. People in the West, this is interesting, but it's not their history. But if you are a Byzantine, Polybius is your history because you are Roman. Theodorus Siculus is your history because he is a Greek speaker from Sicily, but he's also writing about Roman history. Cassius Dio, who gives you all of Roman history from the beginning to the third century AD, that's your history. And it's in Greek because to these people, that is their, that is their political entity. That's where they belong. And so to say the Hellenistic world ends with the Arabs in some ways, yes, because the Greek presence in places like Syria and Egypt really does decline pretty significantly after that. But you could also say the Hellenistic world ends when the Seleucids fall and the Greek presence in places like Bactria and um, what's now Iran disappears. So I think that we're always talking when we're talking about periodization about something that is setting limits to, to a situation that the people living through might not acknowledge is really a difference. Yes, yeah. Edda, thank you. Uh, thanks, Antipi. I'm gonna to turn to Professor Balberg and then to Rafael Nunez. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and thank you so much. And I'm really sorry that I didn't make my uh, craft of history class attend because this was <laughs> such a great introduction to doing history in general. It was great uh, beyond the fact that the, the book is wonderful. Uh, so I did kind of want to ask a question about historians. Historians are very attached to the model of decline and fall. And I'm not, you know, just talking because Gibbon kind of set the stage for how you write history and modernity. 
But, you know, I, I can even think of projects of, you know, the decline of Jews in Muslim countries and things like that. It seems to be a model that historians feel is the one way to tell history. Maybe it's falling out of favor, but it still seems to be a very dominant way of constructing history. And I wanted to kind of uh, hear your opinion about it from sort of the, the history of the profession and, and the discipline of history in general. Are those models um, something that we should try to dispense with? Are they coming from misguided or problematic, dangerous um, political aspirations, like you suggest? So anything you can think about that? This is a really good question. So I'm going to think out loud, and I might end up somewhere I don't want to be, so I might walk back at the end. But I think that... Um, I think that this is attractive because it is this way of talking about change is attractive because it establishes stakes and it establishes a narrative and it gives you a teleology, right? You have an end point. Uh, and so what you're talking about then matters because you start with something and you watch it kind of go away or you watch it become less robust. And, and you then have a, a ready-made story that you can organize around, you can organize your account around. And you also have already underlined very clearly what the stakes are for telling that story. And you know, um, the thing that I think a lot of us sometimes struggle to acknowledge is we choose to write what we choose to write because it interests us at that moment. It seems meaningful to us. And so there is, I think, probably a personal aspect to taking that approach to writing up, up, writing up material in that way, because what's at stake seems in some way relevant to you at that moment. Um, and I certainly see that in my own work. You know, I, I don't have a ton of attention span when I write my scholarship. I get into things, I get very excited about them, I work through them, and then I move on to other things. And um, I can definitely see where my interests were when I start each of my projects, because that is motivating me to do the work. And I think we have to be aware of all of those moves that happen when somebody structures something around decline and fall. Uh, it does work to make the, make the project seem meaningful because there is something that's, that's catastrophic at the end of it. Um, even if you know it's a relatively small group, even if it's the decline and fall of the Athenian Neoplatonic school in the 520s, when you're really talking about like 10 people, um, still, you know, it's it seems consequential because you've put this big structure around it. Exactly. Professor Nunez, uh, your hand is up. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for these um, very interesting presentation. Uh, so I'm an amateur historian and um, I, ha I haven't read the book. So here's a naive question. Um, the question is the following. So I, I was wondering in this process, what is what what is known and what can be said or how could be integrated in a narrative um, if we address let's say all the population that is not part of the big names so i'm talking about i'm presuming thousands of people who are slaves and working as slaves and thousands of people who um i, I imagine are illiterate so um and by the way a little footnote here i would like to know what is the estimate of how many people knew how to read and write in these various periods. And, uh, and then what are their lives about? Uh, what did they fall sick with? Or you know, what was the nutrition, the, the everyday life of all those people who you normally don't, uh, you know, you don't hear about because you just hear about the big names and the, the big actors in all these battles and all these things. So what, what's, what's the point of view of those presumably thousands of people in this process uh, of decline and fall? So this is a really interesting question. And in some ways it's, it's impossible to answer across you know, 2,200 years. But I think that what you can say is um, first the literacy rate, it varies dramatically across Roman history. Uh, the best estimate is based on stuff like Pompeii where you can see the kind of levels of you know, very clear literacy that exists in among populations that are not elite, um, but very clearly are literate. So I don't know, I think the, the estimate, the highest estimate I've seen is around 40%. Um, the, the assumption has always been that this decreases as you go later into Roman history. I don't know that that's true, actually. Um, you know, you with Pompeii, we have a very interesting 
and kind of unique view into how that society is working because you have kind of a time capsule. We don't have that for the ninth century or the 14th century. So it's harder, it's a lot harder to give an estimate. And I think even for Pompeii, it's more of a guess than an estimate. But we are surprised that the like social level where it's clear that people are engaging with each other through like graffiti. Um, in terms of the question of how these ideas are communicated to the illiterate, uh, it's actually very, very effective. Um, there are all kinds of technologies that exist to spread information across the empire um, and to spread ideas across the, the empire. So um, there's something called the Acta Diurna, which is basically a newspaper that was created by Julius Caesar that um, posts news every day. It posts it on whiteboards across the city of Rome and presumably across the empire. People will read these things out. Um, in the Christian period in churches, you have liturgy that gives you kind of instruction in how to understand the past and your place in it, and then how to understand contemporary realities in light of that. Uh, and so if you go through, um, if you go to say a church in Egypt, uh, you will hear in the say, let's just pick a time, the sixth century, you go to a church in Egypt, you will hear in Coptic every day, there will be history lessons in a sense about what the community is, how you fit into that community, how bigger issues of being Roman and Roman progression and Roman advancement uh, and contemporary issues about the Roman society fit into your understanding in that community. Um, and we have the documents that show this. We have sermons that, you know, that show people re referencing um, these history lessons. We have uh, basically texts that contain little snippets of like on this day, we celebrate this saint and this saint and this saint, this is who they are, this is what they did, this is how they fit into you know, larger Roman history. Um, it's actually a very comprehensive instruction in what it means to be part of this society. And that gives you as a leader, the ability to very quickly jump in and say, back in the day, X happened, it's not happening now. Uh, because the figures that you're going to talk about when you say X happened back in the day are familiar. Um, because if you participate in the civic life of that society, you're introduced to them all the time. And in the same way that um, little kids know about George Washington, they know about Abraham Lincoln, and they know kind of what they represent, even if they don't know the details of their lives. Romans would know their history. They would know their previous figures. In a pagan environment, um, there are festivals literally almost every day in the city of Rome that celebrate examples from the past and events from the past. Um, in a Christian context, this is done through the church, but this is a living history and it's done orally and it's done pictorially um, and it's done and it's sort of drilled into you repeatedly through all of these kind of social occasions. So I think that we can imagine that there's a deep awareness of this stuff that transcends the ability to read it. So if I can quickly jump in. And yeah, sure, so, please. If, uh, so what you just said is, would you say that is something that applies to cities, but not necessarily to like rural remote areas? No, it definitely applies in remote areas too. Okay. Um, you know, when you look at like the Synaxary, uh, this is something that's used in all Coptic churches, as far as we can tell. Um, it's not just Alexandria, but it's all up and down the Nile. Uh, and there's a real effort to, to um, standardize these things across Christian communities. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I, I am not a scholar of the manuscripts in Athos, but some of the things that have been found in the manuscripts in Athos are really remarkable. Stuff like the music for the imperial processional um, for Byzantine emperors. You know, I mean, why that would be there, who knows? But, um, but it, I think, suggests that this experience of working in this context is really meaningful. It's not abstract. And regular people are exposed to a lot of this stuff a lot of the time. Okay. Thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask that those who haven't had a chance to ask this question yet, sure, they, sure. they pulled up. Thanks a lot, Zantipi. I think for, uh, Paul Yu has his hand up. Yeah, from so thank you. you. Yeah, so Ed, uh, thanks for the, and then also uh, Seth for the very wonderful uh, discussion here. So I'm curious because, uh, you know, the logistic, uh, you know, the Rome is, you know, geographically island surrounded by water, I mean, basically peninsula. And, um, and how the, the distribution of merchandise like agriculture and so on affect, you know, the rise and decline of, you know, the city government. In the sense that, I mean, we do have climate change in those times and it could become cold at times and then maybe that caused a lot of turmoil 
in terms of invasion. So is this something that you also touch upon in the book? Um, so I, I think that it's important when we're talking about the Roman Empire to understand how big it is. I mean, if it were a country now, it would be the fourth biggest country in the world. Um, in terms of the population of the ancient world, um, if you go to the year one, a quarter of every single person alive lives in that state. It's massive. Um, and so the, the, uh, you know, the, the topography of this place extends from like lowland wetlands in England to, um, you know, desert in Saudi Arabia. It extends from mountains in the sort of border of Russia to the Crimea to uh, Morocco. Um, you have all kinds of different ecologies there. Now, the challenge that you have in the imperial period um, is a challenge that the, the emperors adapt to because they control, they control estates and lands in all kinds of parts around the empire. And so there are mechanisms to transport grain that are really sophisticated. Um, if there's a failure in one part, the empire, the emperor does have the capacity to draw resources that he owns. Uh, and send them to, say, Italy to to support the food supply. He does not have that ability to do it everywhere. And so there is a kind of selective decision making that privileges people in certain places and not in other places. Um, so, for example, like Rome is always going to get resources if it needs it. Uh, if you are in Trier, you probably will get resources from a regional place if it's available. Uh, but you're not going to be getting resources from North Africa. It'd be really hard to get it to, to Trier anyway. Um, but Rome has the advantage of being centrally located. And so if you need resources from Sicily and there's something going on in Sicily that can't provide it, you can get those resources from North Africa or you can get them from Egypt. And even in the Republic, the Republic has the capacity to do that, uh, even though it doesn't directly control territories like that. Um, but by the, by the time of the empire, the emperors have resources in such, in such distribution that for example, in the Mediterranean, um, if there is a low rainfall in the, the places that feed the Nile, that tends to correlate to high rainfall in places that serve the Euphrates. You control both, right? So if you have a shortfall in Egypt, you can supplement that by, by sending resources from Syria. Uh, and so I think when we're talking about the empire at its height, we're not talking about a place that's immune to this, mm -hmm. but it has tremendous flexibility in redirecting resources to try and it, has an also a very well adapted ability to generate surplus resources under central control that can be redirected when there are problems. So, now, so as the state gets I smaller- I up on that. I think it, it sounds like that it is a very centralized uh, system that control also the pricing. Cause this is, um, you know, to stabilize, you know, instead of somebody make profit by trading, it has to be centralized so that you will be, um, you know, nobody, the merchant class will be suppressed, in other words. No, there's a parallel structure. I think what's important to understand, the genius of Augustus is he creates a parallel structure of resources that are solely under the, the control of the emperor. He, they belong to him and him alone, and it's discretionary what he wants to do with them. And so there is this sort of state resources, um, which are continually kept kind of undersupplied because he wants people to have to depend on his whims to support them. There's also private sector, but when the, when the emperor decides to loose his own resources to solve a problem, it is basically going to be way lower cost than the private sector. And it's also going to be something that is done in, um, in above and beyond what the central resources of the state possess. And so it's a control mechanism um, that is, it's centralized to a degree, but it's actually existing outside of a regular economic system. It's in a sense a way that the emperor himself is the person who provides the kind of slack when there's a problem in the empire because then he becomes indispensable. And so it's a, it's a very clear power move um, to do this, but it, it, it is also something that they do not intentionally try to distort markets by using this. It's instead a fallback that they use for emergencies um, because if you distorted a market using these kinds of resources, that would create unpopularity. If you solve a problem, it exists by using these resources that makes you popular. And they understood that very, very well. Thank, Thank you. you. Ed and everyone, it's one o'clock and I know that many of us need to go and we're leaving. I want to, however, share my screen if I can. And um, Ed, this is, this is the book, right? This is the book. This is the book, The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, 
a history of a dangerous idea. How's our distribution chain on this book, Ed? Uh, it's better now than it was at the beginning. <laughs> So uh, I appreciate that. Amazon has them. Um, Barnes and Noble, I think, has them now. So, okay. I know that there are still some more questions, perhaps, but I just want to thank you. I'd want to thank everybody here. I, I really appreciate your engagement with this. I appreciate Ed your your clarity and your uh, your your ability to take these highly complicated issues and both on the page and on the screen untangle so many of these threads. Thank you all for participating and for your questions.